Today I'm going to try attempting the impossible. Now it won't be impossible for the people in this room because you've been hearing these concepts for a long time. But to the people who have not are not accustomed to thinking in these concepts, it'll probably be the impossible. In the slides I got prepared, we start off with the seven kingdoms, but we're going to take a look at these kingdoms from an entirely different perspective than what uh, the Eastern religions look at, and I guess most of the Western religions don't even know the seven kingdoms. We begin with the statement, the soul is white light. Now this is going to be a little bit of a repeat of yesterday, but that's going to go quickly. White light is comprised of the seven colors. It's also comprised of the seven octa or the seven notes of an octave. In order to begin, because they have a statement in there and because I'm respectful, and let's start with a quotation from the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia on the soul's transmigration of. According to these teachings, all human souls have a common origin in the spiritual unity of the primordial, primordial man sparks of which form the individual souls. The sin of Adam brought higher and lower souls into confusion. As a result, every soul has to pass through a series of incarnations. The soul itself has no sex, which is determined by the body and may vary from incarnation to incarnation. That's it. Oh, Alan, what, uh, was that? That was the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia, which is basically quoting the Zohar, which is the center of Jewish mysticism. The, start, the statement that I'm really focusing on, with respect to the statement, sparks of the divine form the individual souls, of secondary importance is a statement every soul has to pass through a series of incarnations. But, and focusing on this sparks of white light, which forms the souls, is com these, the spark of white light. White light is comprised of the seven colors of the rainbow. Here we see a graphic of white light being shined through a prism and we see the seven colors coming out of it. This is what white light is made up of. You can't have white light without these seven colors being in balance. With respect to the statement the soul has no sex. In the white light of the soul, the division of male and female does not exist. It's not this is male and female. It's from, from a soul perspective, it does not exist because it's there. It's at one. Neither does the seven colors that manifest white light. They are one at the level of a soul. There is no division of what we would call, allegorically call heaven and earth. No racial divides. There's no black soul, there's no white soul, there's no red soul, there's only the soul. And within the soul, it expresses itself through the races. The soul is a perfect balance of all the aspects of self that make it up. Here we have a graphic of the white light. And that is what our soul looks like if we journey into the soul, which some of us can, and every Christian, true Christians should be able to journey into the realm of souls and ultimately into the presence of the Logos. Each of the seven centers become a separate entity with the pattern of the whole, holographically replicated into each of the parts. So when, because the soul can't incarnate into this realm, into the limitation of this physical body, what we have is we have the white light broken down into the seven primary colors of the rainbow. Paradoxically, on one level, they remain part of the whole, while on another level, they develop independently. This paradox is as difficult for humans, for organic man to comprehend. It means you have two seemingly opposing truths, sometimes often conflicting, yet the truths become resolved at a higher level of understanding, or a higher level of reality. The sep and by the way, when it says the fruit, the forbidden fruit of the tree of duality, those are male and female impressions, paradoxical opposites. 
The separation was allegorically portrayed as the fall of man. Now I'm going to do a little bit of background before I go into what I want to explain. What is allegorically portrayed as the fall of man was not at all due to any fault of man. But was a natural exploration of self. I have a little puppy, for those of you who have seen it, and he's very immature, does things wrong and whatnot, and he does this because he's immature, because he's a little puppy. Same thing with a child. Child makes mistakes. You have to correct the child. You have to help the child mature. So to say that the fall of man is blamed because someone ate an apple in the Garden of Eden, that's idiocy. Because the soul at that time was totally immature. It had never experienced anything. God experiences self through our souls and our souls through us. We are growing our souls. Our souls are growing God through our experiences in life. This is God's divine schoolhouse. Thus a long ignored statement by Paul is seen in the words. This is one where the people like Augustine and whatnot sort of skip over. And I'll read it. It's at Romans 8, 19 to 22. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. Sons of God is a multitude. Each people person here has the potential to be a son of God, fully formed as your elder brother Jesus. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly. In other words, we didn't want to fall. We didn't want to go through these trials and tribulations. I hated school when I was a kid. Hated it. It was a waste of time as far as I was concerned. For my, from one perspective, going here is like going to school. It's not that we want, you know, we're just as soon sit and be whatever we want to be, life of leisure and whatnot, like a retired person I am now, basically. Don't have to go to work, don't have to do these, don't have to do anything like that. Just have to make my wife happy. Anyway, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly but because of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Take special note, note of the words. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. We are in the process of labor, just like a woman giving birth. This is the process. The fetus is forming. We are the fetuses. We are forming. And we are in the process of the birth process. We haven't gotten to the pangs of birth yet. That's where it gets really trying. When rightly understood, the full of man was brought about by the natural laws of creation, which immersed the soul in an environment of growth from the alpha of ignorance to the omega of enlightened light and self-knowing. Notice I say self-knowing, because when we were sparks, when our souls were sparks of the divine, the soul did not know itself at all. How could it? It had never experienced anything. It was just a spark of white light of an intellect. No knowledge, no nothing. The fall of man is an allegorical portrayal of the birth process. That's important. It's not because somebody sinned in the Garden of Eden. It's because this is the birth process. Matthew 28, 8, 24, 8, Armageddon or end times is portrayed as the beginning of the birth pangs. So if you get up to where Jesus was at Matthew 24, 8, that's the beginning of birth pangs. It's allegorically put forth as a crucifixion, final stage of birth. Everything prior to that point is the birth process. Is it uncomfortable for a birth process? Ask any pregnant woman. She'll tell you. And the more kids she has, 
more uncomfortable it usually gets. I know, because I have eight kids. The spark of the divine that form the souls of man are representative of divine embryos. That's important. When the sperm, the sperm is the carrier of light. And when it joins with the ovum of a woman that's said to there's a flash of light as the soul sends the embryonic image into that embryo. And that's coming together in the light. So our souls, God was giving birth in the beginning when he created all these souls which came forth as sparks of light. The pattern is the same. What that means, if you understand the pattern holographically, if you understand the pattern on one level, you can then apply the pattern to all the levels. That's all it means. The pattern is the same. Natural laws of creation are holographically parallel to laws that form and evolve a human embryo that evolves into a fetus. So if you understand the process of developing in the womb, then you'll understand God's schoolhouse right here. And you'll understand the next level when you try to enter the mother of God and you enter a spiritual womb. This is a, this is a mental womb. You're developing the mind. On the next level, you'll be developing spiritually. I'm going to give a theist versus a deist perception of creation. Now the word deist to some would be of late origin, mainly because of the deists who formed the Constitution of the United States. They were responsible, the deists and the Masons. But Pythagoras was a deist. So too was Plato. So too was Jesus. So too was Valentinius. All these enlightened souls were deists. So, let me do a little bit of reading off my chart here. The theists asserted that it was necessary for Creator God to perpetually intervene in the day-to-day -day affairs of this world. While the deist position was that the Creator God brought forth and initiated a series of laws which he, quoting, endowed the world at creation with self-sustaining and self-acting powers. And then, uh, they say abandoned, but he set back like the father and the prodigal son. The son goes into the far country. Every time the, far, the son gets a little trouble, the father doesn't come rushing into the far country. The son has to first come to his senses and awaken. And only then does the father come and meet him halfway on the road. But the father has to clear the far, the son has to clear the far country in order for the father to even come to him. <coughs> All right, under deist theology has often portrayed as a clockmaker universe theory. The clock, quoting from the, um, I guess the Wikipedia. The clockwork universe theory compares the universe to a mechanical clock wound up by a supreme being or initiated by the Big Bang, which goes along with science. That's why a lot of scientists are now turning to what the deist mindset. It continues ticking along as a perfect machine with its gears governed by the laws of physics, making every single aspect of the machine completely predictable. Before the emergence of quantum mechanics, many scientists believed that the universe was completely deterministic in this way. This conception of the universe consisted of a law, huge, regulated, and uniform machine that operated according to, according to laws in absolute time, space, and motion. God was the master builder who created the perfect machine and let it run. God was the prime mover who brought into being the world and its laws and lawfulness regularly and with beauty. This view of God as the creator who stood aside from the work and didn't get involved directly with humanity was called deism, which predates Newton and was accepted by many who supported the new philosophy. So we're not to think of deism as something that was invented 
uh, in the 1700s or 1600s. Deism is a valid understanding right from the beginning. Then I write, which I'm quoting some of my, my own writings, if the deist perception of God can be portrayed as, as a clockmaker theology, that once the clock is built and wound, it will thereafter function exactly as designed, the theist perspective of God is that of a tinkerer who has pieced together a jalopy that is in need of constant intervention in order to make the thing work. And that's a really important sentence to understand. It's not that man has the power to interact with the laws, with his thoughts. And what he's interacting with is the laws of creation, the, law, the higher self, and, and all that exists. It's not God directly. God is the father in the parable of the prodigal son. God sees through us, but we have to go to return to God to get to the source. In the same way that once an embryo was formed in a woman's womb, its process of development, expansion, birth is brought about by the laws. Remember the pattern. This is also true with respect to the development, expansion, and birth of the soul. Holographically, each aspect of the soul is formed and evolved through the same process. We understand holographically. We understand the laws on one level. We'll understand the laws on all levels because they're all applicable. The theist concept of birth is that the father of the prospective child, this is taken and understand the pattern. The theist conception of birth is that the father of the prospective child must constantly intervene in the womb of the mother in order for the fetus to develop. Now we know that's not true. The father can send thoughts to the developing fetus. He can wish for the best, but it's all a matter of law that's doing that process of birth. The deist understands the natural laws and that once the ovum is fertilized, its development is brought about by laws that closely monitor the development and expansion of the body of the fetus. When the fetus is forming inside of a, a woman, there's no intervention. The laws of the genetics and everything else come into play and create and get the fetus ready for birth. Holographic consciousness, and the development of the soul is the name of this one. In understanding the reality of the twelve within the one, while an octave which is to sound what the seven colors of the rainbow are to color, when the sharps and flats are included within the one, there are twelve. You can't see this in light like you can hear it in sound, but it's the same. The one embryo in the spectrum of light is divided into seven colors of the rainbow. That's the spiritual centers that form within the embryo. Genesis 9:12, 14 to 14. 9, yeah. God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all successive generations, I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. It is a sign of my covenant with you and with all of the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the clouds. So the rainbow then is a universal sign of the covenant between man or the earth, all the earth and God. Understand the rainbow and you begin to understand the divine pattern. In the allegory of the New Testament we see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Of course he's coming in the clouds because that's where the rainbow is. The seven colors of the seven spiritual centers and the seven kingdoms of creation. And this is important to understand. On a mental level the one is divided across the octave of which comprise of seven whole tones and five half tones equaling the twelve spheres of the tree of life. Quoting from my the Bible and also from my websites on treeoflife.nazarene.org. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. 
in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So we understand that the twelve that the tree of life does not have ten spheres, like the Jews draw it, it has twelve. And this was taught to me directly in spirit. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So, our objective here is to overcome so we can be nourished by the fruit of the tree of life, which gives life. And the key to it all is right here. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so they may have the right to the tree of life, and that they may enter into the city in the gates. It's not something we do when we die, physically die. It's something we have to do now. We have to overcome. We have to be able to be nourished by the fruit of the tree of life. Now, while you're in the physical body. Once you're out of the physical body, it can't be accomplished. Here I have an image of the man with the tree of 12 sphere, 12 tree of life superimposed over it, with the Star of David. Now the Star of David was not something that the Jews say came from Babylon when they were carried away. It's a very important symbolism. It's the symbolism of ultimate perfection, perfected consciousness. Holographic consciousness, development to the soul. Spiritually, the one soul embryo, the one soul embryo divides into the seven kingdoms. So our soul, which is a being of light, can't manifest itself into this three-dimensional world. First off, the soul itself is twelve-dimensional, and it is ma and it is magnificent in comparison. And it cannot be limited to the three dimensions of this world or to our physical body. So the only way it can, the light of the soul can enter, is through the seven spiritual centers of the rainbow, which is in us. Mentally, the one soul embryo divides into the 12 spheres of the mind that comprise the tree of life. The tree of life is a pattern of our own mind, of the divine mind, of mind itself. The seven colors of the rainbow are the spiritual centers. This development transpires simultaneously. Each of the seven kingdoms, at the time that the so-called allegorical fall happened, as it came down into the lower levels of creation, or into mind, the white light of the spark of the soul could no longer be manifest, same as it can't manifest in your body. So what we had then, we had this, the the seven kingdoms of creation. And what happened was each of those kingdoms on one level became separate, while another level they remained in harmony with each other. At a soul level they remained in harmony with each other. When we come down into the lower levels of creation, each of them was separate, and not only that, but they became separate within themselves. Each of the seven kingdoms began to develop within themselves, paradoxically on one level independently of the rest, on another level in conjunction with the rest. It would be impossible for the lower kingdoms to develop without a degree of separation from the upper kingdoms. Do you understand that? Everybody understand? Child does not develop until it begins to develop, its, its child itself begins to develop. As long as it remains can hardly connected, hard fast to the mother or father, it can't develop on its own. It has to develop its own personality, its own experience, its own knowledge. This is the same way with each of the seven kingdoms. The Gospel of Thomas, in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus said, Recognize what is in your sight, and that which is hidden from you will become plain. So what is it that we have to recognize? I'm going to quote some um, modern physicists, just to set the stage for using their understanding. 
modern knowledge of universe and what the knowledge of man has given us. Astronomer James Jeans, today there is a wide measure of agreement that the stream of knowledge is heading towards a non-mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. And that's true because we dwell within the mind of God. Max Planck, probably not pronouncing that right, but, who was considered the founder of quantum theory stated, as a man who has developed, devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you as a result of my research that about atoms this much, there is no matter as such. What we call matter is not, is what he's saying. All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system and the atom together. We must assume behind this force the existence of a consciousness and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. What he's talking about is God. Simonist David Forster described an intelligent universe whose apparent concreteness is generated by cosmic data from an unknowable source. The reality of the holographic theory says that our brains mathematically construct hard reality by interpreting frequencies from a dimension transcending time and space. The brain is a hologram interpreting a holographic universe. For physicist Walter Thuring, one of my favorites, has put out, he says, has put out thinking about the essence of matter in a different complex context. It has taken our gaze from the visible, the particles, to the underlying entity, the field, the unseen. Remember, Paul writes that look to the unseen, not the seen, for reality. The presence of matter is merely a disturbance in the perfect state of the field at that place, something accidental, one could almost say a blemish, calling there are no simple laws describing the forces between elementary particles. Order and symmetry, symmetry must be sought in the field. I disagree with his accidental. The blemish that he's talking about is correct, but it's basically the intersecting lines of force from the sources that are creating it. It's not, and there's no, no such thing in this universe as accident. It does not exist. Anyway, in the being, going back to the time of what we allegorically put forth as the fall, because that's what we're basically working on here. The lower three kingdoms appear to us in the form of mineral, vegetable, and animal. Now remember, we're interpreting the mineral, vegetable, animal which is a holographic reality through a holographic brain. So we're seeing these in these images, but these images represent what's behind the source. There's no such thing as concrete matter. I don't know whether I have it in here, but when you, pass, when you get out of the body, or you have a near-death experience, or you pass in this life, you can walk right through these walls. Because while you're subject to the drama that's being played out in God's schoolhouse, once you're out of the body, you're no longer subject to it. If you want to go someplace, you can think it. If you want to go into a room, you can think yourself into that room and you'll go there. So no longer are you limited by, the, by what we perceive as concrete matter. It's all thought, generated thought. Those kingdoms, the lower kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, animal, are thinking, are impressed with what their essence is. And this is what we're seeing and interacting with. In the illusion of an allusion, why I say and why I use the term illusion of an allusion, because most mystics who are only semi-developed see all this creation as an illusion, like you'll listen sometimes to East. From the perspective of the outer darkness of Plato's cave, what we see are allegorical images of aspects of mind that are portrayed as shadow images in Plato's cave. 
Mystics have long portrayed this world as a realm of illusion, often not themselves understanding that the illusion is an allegorical allusion. Which are images, and these images that they see are important. What we see as a dog is an aspect of mind impressed into the form that it has evolved in. What we see as a swine is an aspect of mind impressed into the form that it has evolved in. What these images represent exists within our own mind and at times personify our consciousness. And this is important. While it's paradoxically true that there's external stimulation of a dog or a swine, our whole thought pattern of what these things mean actually comes from our own consciousness. That's why they say you'll see every, nothing other than a reflection of self as you look out at the world. What these images represent exists within our own mind and at times personifies our own consciousness. Thus Jesus said, give not what is holy to dogs nor cast pearls before swine. What Jesus said of the dogs and swine is true with respect to all the images that we see in the outer world. All of which reflect back to us an aspect of consciousness and a mirror of our own mind. In the forms of nature that we observe in the outer world are aspects of mind allegorically impressed into the images we see and reflect an integral part of our own consciousness back to us. This is the shadow images of Plato's cave. Why can't we see the whole thing? Why do we only see the, what the scientist says is the blemish? Why do we only see the shadow images in Plato's cave? Why do we dwell in the outer darkness? Because this is a three-dimensional world and that high reality cannot fully manifest in it. The only way it can fully manifest is for when we overcome and prevail, then we see reality and not before. Then we see how well we have answered the questions on the tests of life, because this is God's schoolhouse. In the analogy of Plato's cave, man is portrayed as a prisoner. When understood, man is a prisoner of his senses, which are limited to a three-dimensional allegorical interpretation of the images, which are blemishes within the great appeal. Our physical senses are limited to a three-dimensional image of a high reality we lack the necessary perception to understand with wholeness. This is why Jesus could see the whole thing. I'll give you an example which is probably home to all of us here. When Jesus looked at the woman at the well he could see that she was connected to five other men. She didn't have a husband because the five men were in conflict within her and she could not have a husband. He could see this. So can anyone with good second sight. This is what that article was talking about, the girl, and this is what I've ri written about. It's called The Real Facts of Life. The illusions of matter. When we interact with the mineral kingdom, we are interacting with what the mineral kingdom represents with our own mind and being. The same is true of the vegetable kingdom as well as the animal kingdom. When an embryo is formed, it divides into the seven and into the twelve. So the embryo begins to form. Because the white light of the soul can't manifest, it manifests through the seven colors of the spiritual centers. Which the mind of the soul becomes manifest in the twelve spheres of mind, which is represented in the tree of life, which is represented in actually the organs of the body. The development is accomplished simultaneously, not in a linear fashion. The brain doesn't first form and then the feet and then this. They all begin to form at one time as it fulfill, fulfills the pattern of creation within ourselves. The concept of linear development is only a partial paradoxical reality. Each of the divisions within the whole spring into simultaneous de development. Now, to get back to your question, you have the two. You have the, the sperm of the father, the organ of the mother, but you then also have the embryonic image projected by the soul, which begins to form the basis of the mind. Mm -hmm. And as the fetus begins to grow, that essence, what Gurdjieff calls the essence self, begins to develop. The, the problem is, 
the same problem with creation that we have this great multitude, you have the great multitude within yourself that most people are totally ignorant of. And they don't understand that the essence of the self becomes so overwhelmed with false personality, ego self, whatever you want to call it, with a lower nature, that it no longer has control over the person once they're born. Anyway, each of the bodily systems begin to develop simultaneously, both separate and in conjunction with each other. The liver begins to form separate and in conjunction with the stomach, the brain, and the rest of the body parts. This is the same thing what happened in creation. Of course, you're just following the pattern, the holographic pattern. Man's organic consciousness can't comprehend this process because he can't conceive of man's holistic paradoxical soul reality. What we have is explosion of mind into consciousness, which the scientists have portrayed as the Big Bang. When the body forms, each of the organs, each of the glands, each of the systems all begin to simultaneously develop, separately, independently, and in conjunction with each other. And this is what happened when the soul entered into the lower realms of creation. The animal kingdom began to develop on its own. The vegetable kingdom began to develop on its own. The mineral kingdom began to develop on its own. Yet at another level, they still remain connected to the soul. But because we were coming into the lower levels of creation, of thought, they could no longer remain in that oneness condition as the soul remains in that oneness condition. And this is important to understand. Any questions on that, Beth? No. Or are you talking about Frankie there? <laughs> Each person a soul-generated personality. I, I, I portray, and here I'm portraying the essence of the self as a soul-generated personality. The soul can't enter the body, but at conception it does generate an embryonic image. That's the soul generating this personality for this time. That's called us. At conception, our soul generated a personality, which we are at the present time. And I portray this, I once more going into a holographic reality that the, if you understand the pattern, you can understand the whole shebang. Each person, a soul-generated personality, is as a single neuron in the mind of the soul. Now, I use the term neuron because that's a point of consciousness within the mind. The mind is broken up into almost infinite number of neurons that affect the thinking, affect the whole person's life. These are points of consciousness within the, within the person. Each person is a single breath of the soul generated into the lower three kingdoms of the soul. Now, let's do a pie chart. Maybe we can understand that. It's not in here, so we're going to go ad living again. Are you listening to the ad living YouTube? <laughs> in the beginning, when all the souls came as, into creation as sparks of the divine, the divine mind came into existence. So we can say that each, because each of the soul, each of those sparks of the divine mind was in itself created in the image and likeness of God, everything that existed also existed within this, each individual soul. So each, we can say that each soul then got a slice of the pie or a piece of the puzzle. When we're created, also, we are created in the image and likeness of the soul. It can be said we are created in the image and likeness of God because it's the same pattern. It's the divine pattern projected into the soul and then into us. But what's important to understand is we get all that exists within the soul. Which means that if the if the God has within himself the, the seven kingdoms and the soul then gets a slice of that puzzle and within, though he's a white light at the soul level he's still composed of those seven kingdoms 
When we, when, when the soul generates a soul image, we have that same seven kingdoms within us. Thus we have a mineral nature. We have a vegetable nature and animal nature which comprise our lower earthly nature. We also have three upper uh, spiritual centers and we have the balance which is the kingdom of man. But each soul person or soul generated personality is as a single neuron in the mind of God. Each person is as the single breath of the soul generated into the lower three kingdoms of the soul, building within themselves a connection between the lower three earthly kingdoms and the upper three heavenly kingdoms. By that I mean, because each of us, when we're formed, has a piece of this part, has a piece, has a single slice of the soul. We're taking parts of the soul, the th uh, parts of the lower three kingdoms that's forming our body, and we're going to work on those, that our allotted piece of the pie. Same as the soul, each soul is like a pie, piece, slice of the pie of God. Each person is as a slice of the pie of the soul. We inherit. We're working on an aspect of the lower three kingdoms and the lower nature. So our body is actually comprised of those lower three kingdoms. It's an animal body. That's why Paul says that the people he personally taught could not comprehend the true meaning of the gospel because they were of an animal soul level of consciousness. And the animal soul is less than our three dimensional and cannot comprehend anything above their limited level. When we pass from this life, our accomplishments will be as the sheep. You've all heard of the sheep and the goats. Sheep on the right hand, goats on the left. Who place the sheep at the right hand, the goats at the left. The sheep are an allegorical portrayal of our successes where we have prevailed over the laws of division. All the fruit, the good things that we have brought forth. And these, what we have done when we, when we were into this life is we are building permanent connections for the soul. Remember in one of the, my emails I said that we're actually like the savior of the soul. Soul can't do anything without us because you can't get down to the nitty gritty dirt of the lower kingdoms. So we, we generate, the prodigal son goes out to deal with the aspects of the far country. And we're dealing with these seven, these three lower kingdoms that the soul can't directly access, even though it's part of the soul. God can't directly access either because the whole God cannot be manifest in the mineral kingdom or the lower three kingdoms. To manifest God, you have to be a soul like Jesus, totally perfected, totally complete. So the sheep are, allegor are an allegorical portrayal of our successes where we have prevailed over the laws of division. And each time we take a success out of this life with us, we're actually giving the soul access to our successes because our lower nature, Cain, was a piece of the pie of the soul's piece. So we're working in that lower nature to refine it and perfect it. Does everybody understand that? Any questions? Because it's important we're going to get to the Big Bang. The goats are those aspects of our lower nature which we have somewhat domesticated but have yet to refine and transform into a position to serve our higher nature. A sheep is known, a sheep is allegory portrayed because it, it clothes man without having to be killed. You cut off the wool, sheep is still alive. You can't do that with a goat. In order to have goat skin, you gotta kill the goat. The sheep, on the other hand, is a image of a perfected animal nature because it clothes man in the, sh in, in the sheep skin without having to kill the sheep. The lower three kingdoms are the opposite polarity to the upper three kingdoms. 
and therefore must be restored into oneness. So these lower three kingdoms which are, which are in the earth are a reflection of the upper three kingdoms which are, in, which are spiritual. And they must be brought together in the center in what we call the fourth kingdom which is the kingdom of man. Paul warned that organic man is of an animal soul level of consciousness, incapable of comprehending the higher reality of the soul. And you'll find that, that link an in inconvenient truth. In the epistle of Peter to James, it states that if the esoteric body of new covenant teachings was lost, that it will remain even for those who really seek the truth, always to wander in error. Why? Because they're missing what I'm going over right now. <clears throat> Unless they begin to develop beyond the organic, they can't comprehend the higher reality. And all they'll do is they'll create man-made dogma that misleads them and grounds them into the earth. Like the concept of the Big Bang, the embryo explodes into the creation process within the mother's womb. The seven kingdoms come into being. Twelve spheres of mind come into being. Each aspect of self is developed both independently on one level and simultaneously on another level. By that I mean what evolve, what develops into the gallbladder develops independently of all the rest as a gallbladder. What evolves as a liver evolves independently. At the same time all the rest are evolving and manifesting. And this has to be all brought together in order for the process of birth to be brought about. The seven kingdoms come into being, the twelve seers of mind come into being. Each aspect of self is developed both independently on one level and simultaneously on another level. And that's important that you get the concept. Even though the gallbladder is evolving independently, it's also part of the whole and working in conjunction with the whole and whatever level it's at. So you can't say linear, it has to be both. It has to be paradoxically. Every aspect and level of being is maintained in both independent consciousness and paradoxically consciousness connected across all dimensions and levels of self. Have you ever read the, the mind of the cell? What they've come to realize is that even a single cell has its own consciousness. Everything is living. You're the fulfillment of a great multitude of consciousnesses stuck in your body, acting both independently and in conjunction with the whole. Every cell of your body has its own consciousness and maintains a connection across the spectrum of all other cells at a higher level. As an individual neuron in the mind of the soul, our objective is to bring about wholeness within ourselves so that we can better connect with the other aspects of the soul that exist across the soul matrix, mind matrix. This is the first time we've used that phrase which I use kind, com commonly. The soul mind matrix. In the same way that the physicist said that the consciousness of the universe is a great con si si uh, mind matrix so too is the soul and so too is us. The thoughts that we have with the conscious personality is like a, a coming together of all the aspects of self that make us up. Well, The soul mind matrix is the same way. And each one of those past life personalities that it lived as continued to dwell in the soul mind matrix. Where we are three dimensional, our higher soul self is twelve dimensional. And what we call time is merely a dimension of mind and consciousness that make up the soul, what we call the mind matrix of the soul. Which means that all the personalities our soul has generated, often appearing to us as other lifetimes, all consciously continue to exist within the soul mind matrix. Robert, you were seen past lives yesterday. I hear you had a you threw poor Ra off the couch and he was doing a regression. It was uh, this morning. Oh, all right, poor Ra. <laughs> anyway, what you, if you, whatever lives you were seeing was not lives that you lived. 
because you were generated at conception and you're going to return to your source in the soul same way as they what you were looking at were past lives that the soul lived not that you lived which means the whole Eastern philosophy of passing through the cloud of forgetfulness is all just Eastern milk there's no such thing as reincarnation from their perspective I'm gonna Gospel of Thomas 84 saying 84 is very important Jesus said when you see your likeness you rejoice but when you see your images which came into being before you and which neither die nor become manifest how much will you bear so those images which we call soul generated personality embryonic images all those what we see as past lives if you have that ability all images that the soul previously generated since the majority of them did not become manifest and did not actually become the soul they exist as fragmentary aspects of the soul within the soul mind matrix each one of them the life that they lived the sheep go positively into the lower nature creating this big matrix in the soul that evolves it because we are the savior of the soul the soul can do nothing without us it states your likeness and your images it does not say when you see God and this is because you dwell within the reality of your own soul self and it is your soul self that is in the above portrayed as your likeness that dwells within God since the soul was created in the image and likeness of God so were we created in the image and likeness of the soul and by proxy were created by image and the image and likeness of God the past soul generated personalities that failed to become manifest or portrayed as previous previous images of which the Gospel of Thomas says neither die nor become manifest in the same way that the physical mind is a matrix of neurons so too is the soul mind each life a soul personality the soul generated returns to the soul and continues to connect of course what the Gospel of Thomas saying 22 presents as the inside like the outside and the outside like the inside and the above like the below and the male and the female 